Amen. So Matthew chapter 12, the focus of the sermon this morning uh, is going to be um, verses 43, 44, and 45. So go ahead and focus there, um, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So we're talking about uh, free will. We're, we're finishing up our free will study this morning. You remember last week we talked about God repenting and why God repents in the Bible, and God repents um, due to the fact that um, we are that variable. God changes his mind in the Bible because of, you know, what we do. Whether or not we do the right thing or the wrong thing, God um, tunes his judgment and or mercy um, accordingly, and that's why God um, changes his mind at times in the Bible. And we should be thankful that God is not just set in his ways, otherwise we would have literally no chance on this earth. So we're going to talk about um, a little bit different aspect of free will um, this morning. I want to kind of talk about this morning why um, you will see um, even saved people sometimes doing um, horrible sins and what the Bible says about um, sin and falling into sin um, for saved people and unsaved people. Look down at Matthew chapter 12 and verse number 43. This is one of um, I don't want to say it's the, the most confusing um, verses in the Bible, but many people are, are very confused about what this means in Matthew chapter 12. So I wouldn't want to just kind of give you the three applications for um, this um, section in the Bible, this passage in the Bible, and then we'll apply that to the sermon this morning. Look at Matthew chapter 12 and verse 43. The Bible says, or Jesus says, When the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and find it none. So main, remember who Jesus is talking to here. He's talking to the Jews of the time, the religious leaders of his time. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out, and when he has come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. So we're talking about a man who is possessed with an unclean spirit or, or a devil, um, as the Bible would say, and, the, and then he goes out and he looks for rest and he can't um, find that rest, and then he comes back to his house, and, you know, things are cleaned up in the house. Look at verse 45. Then goeth he, and taketh with himself seven other spirits, more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. And then these um, words right here are pretty important when it comes to this story. Even so shall it be also. So basically what Jesus is doing is he's using this example of this demon-possessed man as like a metaphor of what he's talking about. And he's directly um, applying it to um, the nation or the wicked generation of the people that he's talking to. And that's, so that's the main application. There's a couple others um, that we can look at. But basically it says, even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. So Jesus is giving um, an object lesson here is what he's doing, if you want to think about it that way. And then it says in verse 46, While he yet talked with the people, behold, his mother and brethren stood out desiring to speak to him. And so that's kind of the end. So basically the three verses, 43, 44, and 45, are what we are going to apply. So basically he's talking about um, the direct application that Jesus is speaking about is the nation of Israel itself. He's comparing it to basically a demon-possessed man, is what he's saying. And he's like, He's like, look, this, this nation is, is like a demon-possessed man, and then this nation goes out and, you know, it gets right or it has the opportunity to get right, and then, you know, it goes back, and then it's going to end up in a worse state than when it started. You know, and if you look at, turn to John chapter 5, if you look at the Jews of Jesus' day, you'll see exactly what he's talking about. He's basically talking about um, these Jewish leaders at the time, they basically, at this point, when Jesus is speaking to them, they had basically created their own religion at that point. I mean, they basically were not following, you know, there's this idea out there, by the way, that, you know, like Christianity is like an offshoot of, of Judaism. That is not true at all. Okay, that's like a modern, liberal, Christian tagline is what that is. Okay, oh, you know, the difference between, you know, Jews and the Christians were the same until Jesus came and then it split. No. The Jews of the time had basically had already created their own religion at that point. And that's why Jesus was so hard on them. Look, Jesus wasn't going to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all the high priests and saying, look, you pretty much have it right and you're doing a good job, except I'm the Messiah now, so now you have to... And that's, Read what Jesus says to the Pharisees throughout. I mean, he is hardest 
on them throughout the entire, um, all four Gospels. He is very hard on them because they've created their own religion. Look at John chapter 5 and verse 46. Jesus tells them this. He tells them, you don't even believe the Bible as it stands now, he tells them. Look at verse 46 of John chapter 5. And the reason that Jesus knows this, and the reason that we know this, is because they didn't believe Jesus. They didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah. Look at verse 46. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, Jesus said, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? The entire Old Testament prophesies Jesus in the way he came, in the place he came, in the entire, I mean, there's you know, over a hundred specific prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament. And he's saying, look, you don't believe the Old Testament. So this idea that, you know, the, the Jews believe the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, that's not true. Right. And Jesus is, is saying that in John chapter 5. So they didn't accept Christ. And the state of that um, generation is going to be worse off because they didn't accept Christ. Jesus. That's what Jesus was getting at. However, you know, we can also apply these verses to just unsaved people in general. We can apply these verses. You know, they come to the knowledge of the truth. You know, they seeketh rest, but they find none. I mean, I've met people that this has happened to. Okay? They, and then, like, they come to the knowledge. Like, the knowledge is right in front of them. I'm sure if you're a soul winner, you've met these people too. You give the gospel to them. They understand everything. They understand it, they know that knowledge, they get it, and they're just like, you know what? Um, they just reject it. They come to that place where they're, you know, they have the gospel right in front of them, and it's a decision point. It's not like, oh, I don't understand it, or, you know, someone hasn't explained it well to me. They just get there, and they're like, you know what? Yeah, I don't think so. And they decide against it. And look, they end up, the Bible says that those people will end up worse off than before. And this matches up, look, it makes sense. First of all, it matches our logic where it makes sense that the more time somebody rejects the truth, the, the harder it's going to be for them to accept the truth. I mean, the best chance you have to, you know, get somebody saved is that first time they hear the gospel and that first time that they hear the truth. And, but the, the more times that people hear it, and just decide not to believe it. Now look, I know people that have had to hear the gospel several times. So don't be this person that's like, oh, they heard the gospel twice and they didn't accept it, so they're reprobate. I mean, don't go there. That's not what I'm, I'm talking about. But I'm just saying that this, this verse applies to people that have heard the truth, they reject the truth, and then they're going to be worse off. They're going to be worse off. I mean, that's a whole Bible study in itself. Hebrews chapter 6, the whole thing. We'll go through that sometime in a later sermon. But the main application I want to make today for Matthew chapter 12 and verse 43, 44, and 45 is for us, for saved people. Look at Matthew chapter 12 and let's see how it matches 2 Peter chapter 2. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 2 and look down at verse number 20. This also can apply to us. This Matthew chapter 12 passage has a lot of application and it can apply to us as well. 2 Peter chapter 2, you say, oh, you're kind of, that's a stretch. But yes, it matches 2 Peter chapter 2. Let's take a look at 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 20, and then I'll show you several other verses um, that show how this could definitely apply to us. And we need to be worried. We need to at least be warned and take heed about this. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 20. The Bible says this. It says, for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them to have not known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. So look, these people, I mean, they know the truth, they've accepted the truth, and then they turn from God's commandment. And those are the type of people we're going to talk about this morning. You say, well, how bad could people turn? Well, we'll take a look at it. But look what it says here. It says, it would have been had better for them to have not known. And what he's talking about here is better for them on this earth. For them not to have known. Because look, I'm going to show you this morning how an unsaved person that just falls into wicked sin and continues in wicked sin is going to have a much easier time in life 
than a saved person that does the same. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb. Turn to Proverbs chapter 26. We'll look at this proverb. The dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Look at Proverbs chapter 26 and verse number 11. So this is a person that you know, knows the Lord Jesus Christ and has known the gospel and has accepted the gospel and has turned from God's holy commandment. And it's turned again. Notice how it's turned to his own vomit again. Look at Proverbs 26. Look at verse number 11. The Bible says, As a dog returneth to his vomit, so a fool returneth to his folly. So the Bible here is saying, and it's clearly warning us, first of all, if you had folly in your past, and then you get saved, and then you return to that folly again, the Bible says you're a fool, first of all. But, I mean, that may be obvious to most of us today. But look, the Bible also warns us that it could be much worse. In Matthew chapter 12, we need to heed that, that it can, we can actually go back to past sins, and then those sins will overtake us worse than before. So, why, I mean, why is the Bible telling us this? You know, there's, first of all, it's two reasons that it's telling us this. Why am I telling you this? The Bible says, you know, it's, first of all, it's an explanation for us. So when we see, we see somebody that's saved, and like, look, we're not saved by our works, we're not kept by our works, we're not, our, our salvation is sealed. It has nothing to do with our works. So when we see somebody who is saved, that falls into some wicked, horrible sin, we see that the Bible told us that this is possible. I mean, think of Saul in the Bible. Think of some of the sins that, man, I think sometimes people forget this. Think of some of the saved people in the Bible and all the horrible things that they've done. Murder. Adultery. Murdering priests. I mean, think of this. Think if this would happen today, what would we think? But the Bible tells us that people can fall back into things and even into worse situations. So, first of all, it's an explanation. It shows us that this can happen. But second of all, it's a warning for us. It's a warning. Go to Psalm chapter 37. Psalm chapter 37. It's a warning that even though we're saved, that we should never let our guard down ever in our lives. Sin always has the capability of dragging us back to where we came from. Always. So look, let's talk this morning about, so we see that, you know, the Bible's explaining to us. It's explaining to us how this could happen to somebody, and it's a warning to us personally. So let's look at some preemptive measures. We have free will in this life. We have free will. You have free will. I have free will. We have, look, we have the Holy Spirit. But we can grieve the Holy Spirit. We looked at that last week. We have this free will. So let's look at some preemptive measures in our lives this morning to handle this free will properly so what we just spoke about in the introduction here doesn't happen to us or anybody that we know. So the first thing I want to show you this morning, look at Psalm chapter 37. The Bible tells us that, yes, there's going to be temptations in our lives, that, that risk of sin is always going to be there, but the Bible does give us hope that we can resist. We can resist. Look at Psalm 37 and verse 31. Look what the Bible says. It says, The law of, of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. So the Bible here is saying that, I mean, this is a super awesome verse. Showing that if the law of God is in your heart, that your steps will not slide. You ever heard of like, you know, someone backsliding? That's what this is talking about. It's talking about not allowing you to backslide. And it says in order to stop that, it's kind of a, a Proverbs type verse here. Where it says, if you do this, this won't happen. It's giving you two sides of the coin here. It says, if you have the law of God in your heart, your steps will not slide. That's why, that's why, by the way, the first step that you'll see in people backsliding is people getting out of church. Like every time. Every time. The first thing is they get out of church. And then, look, it's always the same pattern in this sense. That's how you can outwardly see that someone is having a problem. Look, because look, if you come to church three times a week, I mean, the law of God is, you're going to be thinking about the law of God all the time. 
Because hopefully you're getting sermons that are edifying that make you think about things. Otherwise, I mean, if you're just getting these boring sermons and you're just like, ah, oh, this sermon again, it's not edifying. You're not thinking about it throughout the week. That's why it's important that we actually have, you know, we dig into the Bible in the sermons. So when you come here three times a week, you're thinking about these things. You have the law of God in your heart. So that's why you'll see, you know, you'll be pondering it. You'll be, you know, throughout the week. You'll be, it'll, it'll guide your feet and stop your feet from sliding. Turn to James chapter 1. No, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I don't know why I said James chapter 1. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And look at verse number 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, look at verse 13. So, if you come to church, if you're in your Bible, if you know the Word of God, you're going to be thinking about these things. The Word of God's going to be in your heart. And that's going to stop. It's like a stop from, from you sliding. It's like, you know, I remember I was, I was doing some steel construction when I was a kid. I worked at this steel construction company. And we put these, these metal roofs on these buildings. And we were at this power plant putting this metal roof on this building. And these, these roof sheets were so slippery because they, they put oil on them from the manufacturer. We're up there on this roof. It's like 50 feet in the air. And there's scaffolding right at the edge where the foreman is standing on the scaffolding. And we're up there and we're screwing these sheets down. And the only way we could, we would just start sliding down the roof. And there was two things that would save us. If you caught a screw with your boot, that would save you. And then the last line of defense was the foreman standing at the end. He would just put his hand on your boot. This was not like you know, super safe. <laughs> but, but think about the Word of God, you know, being that, that hand on your boot to stop you from sliding. Okay, that's what the Word of God says in Psalm chapter 37. It'll literally stop you from sliding, stop you from backsliding. Okay, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 13. There's more good news here. Look at this. Therefore, hath no temptation taken you, but such as common to man. It's like, look, any temptation you have, somebody else has gone through. Okay, well, what does that do for me? Thanks a lot. That means that somebody else has been tempted with this. This isn't some new temptation. Whatever you're struggling with or whatever you're is trying to drag you into sin, that's not something that nobody else has dealt with, first of all. Right. You're like, oh, that doesn't really help me personally. Well, keep reading. But God is faithful who will not suffer you, that means allow you, to be tempted above that which you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape. You see that? You see that? A way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. So look what the, let me just read for you James chapter 4 and verse 7. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will free from, flee from you. So the Bible is giving you like uh, kind of a methodology here. It's saying, look, God, look, first of all, anything that you're suffering with, any temptation that you're going through, it's nothing new. There's nothing new under the sun. Other men have dealt with this. And it's very likely that other men or other people have dealt with it in a better way than you're, that you're dealing with it right now. That's basically what God is saying right here. He's, he's saying, he's like, look, there's a way to escape. You're like, it's just, it's too tempting. I just can't, look, I just can't, I can't do it. I just keep falling into this sin. Look, you're not trying hard enough. That's what the Bible says. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and verse number 13, it says, look, God will let it make a way for you to escape. You're just not choosing that way. You know, it's the problem that basically 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and verse number 13 Combined with James chapter 4, look, James chapter 4 and verse number 7 basically says, if you try hard enough, it will go away. Amen. If you resist hard enough, it'll go away. Like, I can't live my life with this kind of temptation every single day, every single hour. It'll stop. Right. It'll go away. And it says in, in 1 Corinthians 10, 13 that it, it's possible to resist it. So if you resist it, it will go away. And it is possible if you're saved to resist it. So if you can't resist it and you keep falling into these sins and you're struggling with something you keep falling into, the problem is you. Right. You're weak. Right. You know, the problem is you're, you're too weak. You know, the problem is we were, you know, we were talking about this a few days ago. But look, here's the problem. I mean, some people just can't deny themselves. This is an American problem. This is an American problem. Some people deny themselves nothing. Too many people deny themselves nothing. You know they're right. You know why? You know why they do that? Because they're raised. Because they weren't raised right. Basically, they were raised and they were denied nothing. That's how it happened. 
That's how you get an adult that grows, that it grows to a, a child that grows to adulthood. And you know what? Maybe they're saved. We're talking about saved people. You end up with a saved adult who can't keep himself out of sin because he can't. He just acts that way now. He can't deny himself anything because he's never been denied anything. I mean, life is just, for way too many people, life is just, what can you do for me? Yeah. Life with friends is like, hey, you now I have all these people that can do stuff for me. This is, this is the problem. This is the problem with Christians. This is why, this is why we talk about raising kids so much here. This is why we talk about, you know, here, you know, what the, you know what the problem is with that adult? It's one word. Discipline. Discipline. That's why you're supposed to discipline your children. Look, if you, if, you, if you find these parents that bribe their children with things, look, if you bribe your children with things ever to get them to do what you want, that's not discipline. You know what you're doing? You're destroying them. You know what you're doing? You're setting them up for when they become an adult to just fall into wicked sin and not be able to ever get themselves out or stay out of wicked sin. Maybe they get saved. Maybe they get out of that wicked sin. But then they go back and it's worse. That's what you're doing when they're two. Discipline. Discipline is taught. Just rem I mean, you say, I don't know, do I do that? Just re just, here's, a, here's a mantra for you. Every time you want to bribe your children to get them to comply, instead of just applying biblical discipline, just tell yourself, I'm a bad parent. Because that's what it is. That's what it is. Look, you're, you're going to destroy, you're going to end up with destroyed adults, is what you're going to have. Because in order for the devil to flee, folks, they have to resist. In order for the devil to, to flee you, you have to resist. You have to deny yourself. You have to have self discipline. You have to have self control. That's what you're teaching your kids is self-control. So the Bible tells us, I mean, so this is some good news, folks. This is at the beginning. This is the first one. Some good news. Number one, there will be nothing that's in front of you that you can't handle. That's what God says. And God's faithful. It says God is faithful. God is faithful and will not put anything in front of you that you can't handle. If you are continually falling into it, the problem is you. And then it gets even better saying if you're able to resist, like, you're gonna, I'm, I'm resisting and I'm resisting. It's going gonna, it's gonna to go away. The devil will flee from you, the Bible says. So we're talking about practical ways to not fall back into or get worse off than we were before we even got saved. The second thing is this. Know your weaknesses. Notice in Matthew chapter 12 and in 2 Peter chapter 2. In 2 Peter chapter 2 it says, and again entangled therein. It was something that had happened before. It was something that this person, or, and you'll find that many times. You'll find that many times. If there's some you know, Christian that falls in or falls away or backslides and falls into some wicked thing, you will find that it, is, it was really nothing new that they had never been into before. Many times it's a sin that they are re re returning to, as Proverbs chapter 26 says. So look, avoid places, first of all, that might be temptations to you. I mean, many places that are temptations to you, you probably shouldn't be in the first place, but maybe you need to put in some extra, you know, protections in for yourself. If you're struggling with certain temptations. You know, if you have a drinking problem, you know, maybe just avoid all places in general that sell alcohol. Restaurants, bars, I mean, you shouldn't be in a bar, obviously, but I mean, you know, many restaurants, I mean, if that's a temptation for you, don't go to those places. You know, inter the internet, if the internet is a problem for you, you need to put some things in place so it's not a problem. You should have those things in place anyway. But look, you need to, you need to avoid places and locations of things that you're struggling with, or things that maybe you struggled with in the past. You can't just think, I'm good, it's, everything's fine, I'm saved. You cannot do that. Right. Here's another one. Avoid people. Avoid people that may be temptations to you. 
I, I mean, look, I was talking to the guys this morning. I'm, I'm almost to the point where I feel like, you know, I almost can't talk to anybody <laughs> anymore. You know, just because, you know, you start talking to somebody, you know, out on a weekend, or you, if you're out fishing or something, you start talking to someone, uh, you know, I don't want to be unfriendly, but I also don't want to talk to some stupid idiot standing there drunk with a beer. I, I mean, I, I don't want to be around people like that. But look, specifically, you need to, you need to avoid people that are, are into sins that you have done in the past or struggled with in the past. Look, even Alcoholics Anonymous knows this. Right. Like, you can't try to quit sin and then just hang around with a bunch of people that are, like, committing sin. Right. It's not going to work. Just like you wouldn't, attack, you wouldn't hang around somebody who's attacking your faith all the time. You know, it's like, it's like a, a good analogy is that you're trying to build a house. Right? You're trying to, you're trying to build a house. And, you know, then you hang around all these people and they, they come and kick your house down. Right. You're trying to build this house. And then you go hang around with your friends and they kick your house down. I mean, look, some people are going to really struggle here because they just can't draw lines in their life. Right. And it's going to drag them back into sin. Right. I mean, whether that be sin, whether that be a lifestyle, whether that be your actual beliefs. Look, it's the most important. Building this house is the most important thing to my life and to my family. And every time these people are around, they start tearing down walls. Look, you got to start figuring this out. I mean, you got to start being like, hmm, hmm, why is that? These people aren't my friends. Aha! You got it. You found it. It takes some longer to get there than others, but think about that. What is your house? What are the things you're trying to build in your family? What are the things you're trying to keep your family away from? And are the people that you're hanging around with, are they trying to tear down walls in that structure? If they are, those people are not your friends. That's what you need to realize. And meanwhile, while they're kicking down your walls and you're trying to figure this out, and you're in this situation where you're building and they're tearing down and you're building and they're tearing down, look, there's just absolute danger there. The whole time that you can't draw these lines, there's danger there. There's danger of sin. There's danger of the lifestyle. There's danger even to beliefs for the next generation. There's a lot of danger there. What's the third thing? What's the third thing that we can proactively look at here to try to keep us away from um, some of these things? Look at, look at Lamentations chapter 3. I think there's this idea that because we're saved, that, you know, we just, we're automatically always going to have this great relationship with the Lord, and the Lord's just beaming down on us all the time just because we're saved, and, you know, everything's just going to be great. But I hate to wreck your morning with the Bible. Look at Lamentations chapter 3 and verse number 39. The Bible says this, the third point is this. As a believer, as a saved person, God will not go easy on you. You need to remember this. Look at Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 39. The Bible says, Wherefore doth a living man complain, a man for the punishment of his sins? Let us search and try our ways and turn again to the Lord. This was probably who was already turned to the Lord at one point. They returned to the Lord. And then they, they slid away. They slid away. And now the Bible is saying here, it says, we need to turn again to the Lord. This person is saying. Let us lift up our heart with our hands unto God in the heavens. We have transgressed and rebelled. And then look what God, and then God just, everything is great. And no, it says, thou hast not pardoned. Look, you're going to pay. You're going to pay as a believer, as a saved person. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 18. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 18. You know, look, by the way, see the entire Old Testament. I'm reading you a few verses here. But if you think that God's going to go easy on the believer, see the entire Old Testament. It's just judgment on believers is what it is. Look at Ezekiel chapter 18. Look at verse 24. Look, you are going to pay as a saved person. It's going to be terrible, the payment. Look at what the Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 24. But when the righteous, that's you, 
You're righteous through the blood of Christ. That's what it's talking about here. It's not saying when the sinless or when the perfect. No, it's, it's when the believer it's talking about. Turneth away from his righteousness and committeth iniquity and doeth according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth. Look what it says. Shall he live? The Bible here is saying that there's all these wicked people out here that do this stuff, and they're all doing all these wicked things, and they're out here just living this worldly life. And it says, if you turn to that as a righteous person, as a saved person, it's like, shall he live? It asks the question. Shall you be allowed to live if you do that? All his, and then it gets even better. It gets even better or more depressing, depending on how you're looking at this. All his righteousness that he done shall not be mentioned. But I was in church for 10 years, soul winning once a week, and I was getting all these people saved, and then I turned to wickedness. Not even going to be mentioned. Right. The fact that you're in wickedness and have joined the world, that's what's going to be mentioned. This person has done some good things. All his righteousness will not be mentioned when it comes to the judgment that he's going to receive. Right. In his trespass that he hath trespassed, and in his sin that he hath sinned, in them shall he die. Look, it doesn't matter all your righteousness that you did before. Wow, that's harsh. Yet ye say, the way of the Lord is not equal. Hear now, O house of Israel. These are God's people right here, by the way, that he's talking to. Is not my way equal? Are not your ways unequal? You can apply every single verse talking about Israel in the Old Testament to you. As a saved believer as God's kingdom, as God's saved individual, as the righteousness of God that you put on through Christ. This applies directly to you personally right here. It doesn't matter all the good things, how great you think you are. Or maybe you have done good things. When you slide away, you're going to pay for those things. That's what the Bible is saying here. So look, you should be, I mean, God's going to be harder on you. I've had somebody say that to me out soul winning, and they got this. Like, oh man, they're thinking about all their sins. Like, oh man, I'm in trouble now. Yes, you are. If you're in a bunch of sin, you get saved, and you continue in a bunch of sin, things are going to go much different for you. Amen. That's what the Bible says. So look, folks, we are saved. But free will is always there. It's always there. And because of that free will... Because of that free will, God repents in the Bible. Thank God that God repents in the Bible. He repents you know, from direct judgment to mercy, mercy according to our choices, our free will. And we always need to remember that as saved people, we are never out of the woods. We are never out of the woods. I want to just give you an example to close that I was thinking about uh, that came to my mind when when I was writing this sermon and I was thinking about um, this subject. So as a kid, as a kid, when I was growing up, I always remember, um, I always remember kind of like watching like marriages. I don't know, it, it seems strange, I know, but maybe you'll understand when I explain it a little bit better. I was always interested in being married as a, as a kid, as a young man. Even when I was like 10, 12, 14, I was always interested in being married. You know, and I was seeing all these people married for years, and, and thank God, like my parents... And like my, my grandparents on both sides, my wife's parents, her grandparents on both sides, great-grandparents, the whole thing. There's never been a divorce there. And I mean, I'm very thankful for that because when I was growing up, and I mean, my parents argued. I remember, I can remember some arguments that my parents had. You know, like heated arguments between my parents. I never once thought, oh man, they might get divorced. That never even entered my mind. And I'm thankful that it never even entered my parents' mind either. As a matter of fact, it was... It was only until I was like in high school that I started to see, um, I started to know some kids in school who, whose parents were divorced. And I started to kind of like, maybe middle school, high school, and I started to kind of understand what that meant, was that they're living with their mom or their dad or, you know, it was always a very, it, first of all, it was a one-off. It was very strange. It was very strange. My wife gives an uh, uh, example um, one time, you know, just like she wasn't allowed to like hang out with any kids like, whose parents were divorced. I mean, imagine, who are you going to hang out with today? But I mean, you know, that was, that's how, like, that's how shameful it was to be divorced. And, but look, I just remember watching these marriages and just thinking, like, 
I, I was thinking, because I, I always wanted to be married, and I don't know, maybe people don't feel that way anymore or whatever, but um, I always wanted to be married since I was, you know, a, a teenager. And, and I just remember thinking, when you'd see, you know, these things happen, like, okay, you know, when, when are you in the clear? Because, I mean, I wanted to be married. I want to be good at it. I don't want to mess it up. You know, you don't want to get married and mess it up. So I was like, okay, how many years do you have to be married, you know, before you're good? You know, how many years before, you know, you, you know maybe like five years or, or ten years? And then, and then it's like, I've done it. You know, I'm going to make it. You know, but look, after years, I grow up, I turn 30, I turn 35, I turn 40, and I start to see, and I start to see people that have been married for 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, getting divorced. And I mean, I'm sure you can think of these same cases, and here's why. Did you know, I mean, I'm going to read you some shocking things right here. Listen to this. Baby boomers continue to divorce more than any other age group. These are, these are people that are over the age of 65, basically. In the years between 1990 and 2012, the divorce rate for people 55 to 64 doubled. For those older than 65, that number more than tripled. It's the, look, the older generation, the, the baby boomer generation among us, and I'm, look, I'm not picking on the baby boomers here, but I'm just saying that the, the people that have been married for 40 plus years are divorcing at the highest rate. So this idea that I had in my head that, okay, you know, after 20 years, you're good, or after 15 years, you're good. Look, it's obviously not, you know, it's not true. By the way, just a side note, maybe this idea of saving up millions of dollars so I can retire and sit on a, a, a beach and get drunk for 30 years is not a good idea. Right. You know, maybe this whole idea of, of, I mean, who comes up with this stuff anyway? I mean, all, all you have to do is go out like camping and you just see these people. <laughs> That's what they're doing. They, they get a, they're going to go and they're going to sit on a beach and they're going to drink for 25 years. That's what they're going to do. Good plan. Good plan. And they're doing it by themselves because, you know, all their children hate them. Right. But look, I've been watching this retirement disaster for over a decade now. As a matter of fact, I can't think of one situation where it's really turned out positive. I mean, I can't think of a good story. I just keep watching people that have retired just keep getting worse and worse and worse. I'll give you an example. A guy I knew 10 years ago, and I'll tie it back into the sermon, a guy I knew 10 years ago, he retired 10 years ago in this generation. He retired and he, he built this big vacation home and then he moved into this vacation home away from his wife for the week and his wife was in town still working and he was retired just hanging out in this vacation home. He didn't really have any hobbies. He didn't really have any hobbies. He just retired and he just would hang out at this, you know, he built this big ridiculous wood shop that, you know, I don't even know if he ever used it one time. But I guess he's going to build furniture for 30 years, I, I told my wife. But I told my wife, I said, as soon as I saw that this, this plan start, I was like, this will not end well. I told my wife. And now, he's divorced. He's divorced after being married for over 40 years. Just, I mean, there is no safe zone after 40 years of marriage. Look, life just is just as in marriage because of free will, you are never in the clear. Never. Turn to Romans chapter 7. Turn to Romans chapter 7. And you know what? I don't know exactly how it played out. But I'm, I'm pretty sure it followed this pattern. Little sins led to big sins. I'm pretty sure it followed this pattern. Look at Romans chapter 7. And look at verse number 13. Romans chapter 7, look at verse number 13. The Bible says, or look at the front of your bulletin. The Bible says, Wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. So the law is good. The law is good for us. It's not going to save you, but it is good for you was then that which is good made death unto me. God forbid. Look, it can't kill you. Did you know that the law can't spiritually kill you? 
The law cannot put you into hell. Not if you're saved. God forbid, but sin, that it might appear sin. This is what the law is for you. Is so when you see sin, it looks like sin. So when you see sin come in front of you, you're like, oh yeah, that's sin right there. I need to stay away from that. You know, that is a huge couple of words right there that appear sin. Because that's what happens to people. That's what happens to people. With the, it always starts with the little stuff. It's like, oh yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, this isn't even really a sin. I mean, Jesus turned water into wine. It's not even really a sin. You know, they just, they turn a, they take, they start with little things. And then look what it says, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment. It's the Word of God that makes sin appear sin and also makes it look exceedingly sinful. So not only are you going to recognize it, but you're going to be like, whoa, that's not even a little sin. Because you're going to see what looks like a little sin if you're in the law and that law of God, Psalm 37, is in your heart and you're in it and you see that little sin, you're going to see everything that it leads to. And you're going to be like, whoa, not going down that road. This, look, I'm sure with this guy, I'm sure it started with boredom. I'm sure it started with just like, just slothfulness. That's a small one. Just, I don't really have anything to do. Just leaving things undone. You know, I'm sure it, maybe, maybe there was some, some, you know, hanging out on the internet, which I do know that that was a part of it. Hanging out on the internet, maybe ending up in the wrong places on the internet, meeting the wrong people on the internet. Maybe, maybe starting to drink, maybe starting to drink more. Pretty soon, we're into larger sins. Pretty soon, we're into huge sins. Now, we're into life-changing sin. That's why it didn't happen. That's why it didn't happen. He didn't retire and get divorced a week later. He retired and he got divorced several years later. But it just, it was this slow progression. Because you know what? He wasn't in. He didn't have the Bible. And he was, that wasn't in his heart. And so, he didn't recognize the little sin. It didn't appear sin to him. It didn't appear exceedingly sinful to him. He just kept, he just, he just kept plowing through you know, warning sign after warning barrier after warning barrier. And there's all these guys waving signs. Stop, stop. And he's like, ah, oh, no, it's good. It's fine. I mean, it, now we're into irreversible sin. Look, that, that free will is always going to be there. It's always going to be there. Being saved doesn't change that. As a matter of fact, you know, it just means that God's going to come down harder on you. And it makes sense, right? It makes sense that God would come down harder on you because, you know what? Um, God needs results in this world. As 99% of the world is unsaved, God needs results. And you know who he needs results from? He needs results from you. He's not down here soul winning. He's not down here trying to get people saved. Look, he's given us the Bible. He's given us the sword. He needs somebody to carry it around and swing it around is what he needs. Look, so it would make sense that God would come down hardest on us. It makes perfect sense. First of all, he's the, he's the best father. But, I mean, with somebody who's not even saved, it's just like, that problem's taken care of. They're just going to go to hell. And there's no judgment like that judgment. There's, there's nothing else. Look, we are the main tools of restoration for this world. It's us. It makes sense that God would come down so hard on us if we're not, you know, being a, a, a good tool to help restore people. And look, if God, if we're a bad tool, just, just imagine, what would you do with the bad tool? You got a tool in your garage, it's taking up all this space, and then every time you use the tool, think about this, every time you use the tool, like I'm going to use this tool to fix my uh, wheel. And every time I use this tool, it breaks everything I'm trying to fix. Imagine that. What are you going to do with that tool? Every single time I pick up this tool to try to cut down a tree branch, I just, I, I accidentally cut the whole tree down. Or it, it kills the tree. Or whatever. The tool just breaks. It's not only the tool doesn't work, but it breaks everything. You're going to throw that tool away. That's why God killed Saul. That's why, that's why in Lamentations chapter 3, Ezekiel, that I just read to you, that's why God says, you know what? 
There, there's times where God's just like, you know what, I'm just, I'm just bringing this tool home early. <laughs> it's just doing too much damage down there. That's why. Because you are the tool to restore other people. And if you're working against that, and you don't think that if you're saved and you've tried to get you know, the gospel to several people and then all of a sudden you fall into wicked sin, you know what? Wicked people are going to look at that and be like, look at this. What do you think of that? You're going to do damage to the gospel. Right. It's not only not having a testimony, it's destroying the testimony of the people around you that have the same beliefs as you. That's why God brings home, people home early. Think about that. It's, it's, a, it's a big warning, folks. We have a responsibility, and if we use this free will against, and we, tr we literally, as the Bible says, trample on the Lord Jesus Christ with our free will, God could bring you home early for it. And, and it makes perfect sense why he would. Free will. It, it can be really, really good. Or it can be... It could be the end of us, literally. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.